Now, the new development bank, also known as the BRICS Bank, has dispersed uh, close to 33 billion US dollars for nearly 100 projects, with particular emphasis on infrastructure across all the BRICS countries. It says its big focus these days has been on energy projects, particularly in South Africa. So, South uh, SABC News' senior economics reporter Nampumalelo Siziba caught up with uh, Leslie Maastop on the BRICS Bank. Uh, she started by asking how far the bank has come in its developmental finance work. You've been at the New Development Bank for a while now, uh, commonly known as the BRICS Bank. Um, this is a significant year. It's being held in South Africa, your home country. Um, but what is the significance of this particular summit uh, for the bank? Uh, how far have you come since your establishment uh, all those years ago, 20, 2015, I think it was? How far have you come and why is it important this year? Thank you very much for, for having me. I mean, it is indeed quite, uh, you know, um, historical in the sense that uh, it was exactly 10 years ago in 2013 that the first summit was held here in uh, South Africa. At that stage, the idea of the bank uh, was born. As you correctly pointed out, in 2015, we established the institution from a complete startup. Today, we are eight years old. We have done uh, just over 100 infrastructure projects, $35 billion in total. So significant achievements from the bank. The second key point to make is that this summit is uh, quite significant in the sense that it is the first time that we have so many heads of state attending, meaning there is so much of a buzz, enthusiasm and interest around uh, BRICS. It's clear that the BRICS concept will now become something much bigger. But that will mean also it will translate into expansion of the bank. The New Development Bank has um, now eight new, uh, uh, eight members in total, the BRICS countries, it's five, and then Bangladesh have joined, as you know, uh, Egypt has joined, United Arab Emirates have joined. But as new countries join, they bring in fresh capital for the bank, which enable us to lend more into the future, again, increasing the size and scope of our activity. So what benefit do non-BRICS members get from investing in the new development bank? Um, you know, are they equal to the original BRICS members? How does it work? Yeah. So the five BRICS countries own the bank uh, in an equal um, uh, fashion. So each country put in $2 billion. So we had $10 billion of equity invested in the bank when we started out. The bank also has an additional, it's called callable capital, additional guarantee from the uh, member countries in case the bank needs to tap into that capital. When new members come in, the existing shareholders dilute their shareholding, which means that new countries also put money into the bank. So they will get direct benefits that we will then in turn build infrastructure, uh, finance new power, finance upgrading of ports, build new rail infrastructure. So they will benefit directly. South Africa, Brazil, India, China and so on will always be the largest shareholders in uh, the bank. It was set up like that. The Articles of Agreement or the bank's constitution provides that the BRICS countries will always own above or rather 55% of the bank. So the control will always be with the BRICS countries. So tell us, for South Africans who are viewing, what exciting projects um, is the BRICS Bank currently invested in? Are we anywhere near the maturation of those projects and so on? So the bank is heavily invested in energy first. South Africa's biggest challenge, as you know, is energy security, right? ESCOM has gone through major challenges over the last 10 years, and they are still in the middle of a significant sort of supply-demand mismatch in terms of power. So we have invested heavily in, uh, in the energy uh, sector. We provide financing to the Development Bank of Southern Africa, Industrial Development Corporation, uh, for uh, independent power producers. So we're making money available to build new energy uh, capacity. Secondly, we've got major investments in the transport uh, sector. We are upgrading the port of Durban. As you might know, about 60% of South Africa's imports and exports go through the port of Durban. We are now uh, increasing the scope and scale of that uh, port, which will contribute to economic growth. When we can export more goods, it stimulates job creation and uh, so on. Thirdly, we have major investment in the water sector. 
traffic is a water scarce country, as you, as you know. We will now be financing the building of new dams in uh, on the, the Sutu Islands Water Project, which in turn provides water to Gauteng. So transport, energy, water are just some of the major sectors that we are investing. Then also, we have major investors in road infrastructure in South Africa. We have approved the loan of 7 billion rand to South African National Roads Agency, the upgrading of roads, building of new roads. So we are working to improve infrastructure in South Africa, which lay the foundation for further economic growth. So how is the bank intersecting with the concept or the reality of the African continental free trade area? Uh, is there a strategy around that and ensuring that you help funding the wheels of that actually working? So we only work in member countries of the bank, countries that have put capital into the bank. So right now we are only investing in South Africa, financing projects in South Africa and in Egypt. When other countries in Africa join, we will also begin to finance projects there. But we are not directly involved in the African Free Trade Agreement, which Minister Patel spoke about uh, this morning. That's driven by the government. Okay. And then one last question, Mr. Mazdorp. Um, there's a whole discussion debate going on about the BRICS looking to de-dollarize. Um, some official spokespeople of the, of the BRICS are saying, no, that's not the case. We actually want a situation where we're trading more in local currencies to deal with the fluctuations of you know hard currencies and so on and so forth but just give us a sense of what it is the bank actually lends in and if it is your traditional dollar you know or euro and so on why aren't you looking to uh, lend more in yuan or rand or anything else for that matter to deal with those kinds of challenges so the bank's strategy right now is to have 70% of our lending done in hard currencies, mainly uh, dollar, but also uh, euro, British pound and other currencies, and then 30% in the currencies of our member countries. Uh, just recently, a couple of days ago, a week ago exactly, the bank raised 1.5 billion rand here in South Africa on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. That money will be on lend for projects in South Africa. We're doing the same in China, where we have raised 40 billion renminbi that's about 80 billion rand equivalent for projects in uh, China. So in China we're probably the most established in terms of local currency financing. We are now going to expand that strategy into the other BRICS uh, member countries. I just returned from India two weeks ago where we have spoken to policymakers there to also raise rupee bonds onshore in uh, India. So you are absolutely correct that the focus of the bank is to increase the use of local currencies because our countries have very strong capital markets, very deep capital markets, um, but the cheaper sources of funding is still in uh, dollars. That's why 70% is focused on the US dollar.